Hello, this is Gary Millett again. This is topic number three of our sensor short course. And uh, this is part two. And it's actually about some special types of sensors, about sensors used by ADAS systems in automobiles. Uh, ADAS standing for Advanced Driver Assistance Systems. And uh, this is kind of an optional topic. If you're not interested in, in this topic, you may want to skip this. If you have some interest, you might find this worthwhile. So let's get started. It's a rather long 70 slides. So in the last decade, the automotive industry started to use radar as a sensor uh, for two reasons. One for safety reasons and uh, uh, the other for autonomous vehicle uh, development. So <clears throat> let's go back, take a look at the earliest uses of radar. Uh, they were very specific. Radar was developed for military use in the detection of enemy aircraft or ships at sea, and consequently for use in fire control systems for the improvement of weapon systems. Uh, over the course of time, radar has been adapted to many peacetime applications, from things like air traffic control to the popular Doppler radar used for weather forecasting. Today's radar systems have become a ubiquitous technology. So the principle of radar operation is fairly simple and based on well-known laws of physics. A short burst, that is a pulse of electromagnetic waves, are broadcast in a particular direction. This is usually done by a very directional antenna system. After this short burst, the system listens for an echo of the transmitted signal. Any echo signal received indicates some type of target has reflected the transmitted signal. Now, what are radar echoes? Well, the first thing that radar can do for the user is initial target detection. It is known from the basic principles of wave motion that if a propagating wave encounters an obstacle in its path, depending upon the physical makeup or characteristic of the obstacle, wave energy will be reflected off of the obstacle. Uh, there's many things in our life experience that we know this has happened. Echoes, for instance, uh, sound waves bouncing off a wall or uh, you know the side of a canyon or something like that, uh, or building. Um, throwing a pebble into a pond, uh, the waves that propagate out from the, where the pebble enters the water, uh, when they get to the uh, shore, they bounce back. Um, so we're kind of familiar with this type of operation of wave uh, propagation. Also, depending upon the object's shape, more or less energy will be reflected back towards the original wave energy source. So what about radar ranging? Well. The time delay of from when the initial radio frequency or RF signal was first transmitted until the echo returns to the radar system may be used to determine the distance or range of the detected object. Electromagnetic waves travel at the speed of light, C, which is approximately equal to 186,000 miles per second or 300 million meters per second. Using this velocity value, it's fairly straightforward to calculate target distance. So here's some radar ranging mathematics. I won't go over the details, but let's take a look. The distance of an electromagnetic wave travels in a smaller time frame, like a nanosecond, a billionth of a second, can be determined to be approximately one foot. So the calculations are done there, and in one nanosecond, we get 11.811 inches, or approximately a foot of travel per nanosecond. Now, there are limitations for ranging. So let's consider the implications of the calculations in the last slide. Early military radar systems were used to detect objects beyond our human senses, that is, our hearing and eyesight, in other words, miles away. The echo from an aircraft about 10 miles away from the radar system takes about 52,800 nanoseconds to travel back from the target for a total round trip time of about 106 microseconds, or about a tenth of a millisecond. For a target a distance of roughly 5 to 15 miles, the system is dealing with echo time delays that are fractions of a millisecond in duration or tens to hundreds of microseconds. It's not obvious to the casual observer, but early electronic systems were speed and frequency challenged. Systems in the 1960s could only process signals and data in the microsecond to hundreds of nanoseconds time frame. A computer program might take seconds to complete. 
not very fast compared to today. Another basic principle of physics is that the reflected echo signal power will be reduced by the distance that a target raised to the fourth power. These are arranging limitations, part two. In fact, in of itself, this fact rather, in of itself, limits the distance over which the radar can operate and reflected signals may be detected. Lastly, but directly related to something I already pointed out, with early electronics technology, it was very difficult to create much RF power at very high frequencies. There is an inverse relationship between time and frequency. Now, the equation shown here says frequency equals one over time or vice versa, time equals one over frequency. So when it was mentioned before about the speed at which signals could be processed, this was directly related to the highest frequencies that electronic systems could produce or could operate at. Furthermore, the higher the frequency, the more the cost of the system. One last thing, this is our limitations part three. The directionality and gain of an antenna used for radar is directly, directly related to its size and frequency of operation. Now, this is a real old radar. So this picture shows an older military radar that operated at a lower RF frequency, probably at LBN, one to two gigahertz, which is below the frequency used by a microwave oven, 2.45 gigahertz. Notice the size of the system's antenna. That's pretty big. And again, you need a big antenna to get a lot of directionality or high gain. So summarizing radar limit limitations. So to summarize what all this means, for radar to be a viable technology for applications involving automobile fields, electronics had to evolve significantly and computer technology had to also evolve. That has become much smaller, less costly, and certainly much faster. Specifically, the frequency of operation has to be in the millimeter wave regime to achieve the spatial resolution needed. That's all related to antenna size with sufficient power to have the required range for the particular application. The targets that radar is trying to detect in automotive applications. Well, the target basically is typically other vehicles or obstacles, anything that could cause a collision, including pedestrians. That being the case, radar detects anything that reflects the transmitted pulse, anything that is in the surrounding environment. These additional echoes are known as clutter and tend to mask the true targets. Therefore, complex signal processing is necessary to determine what is being seen by the radar system. And I should tell you that you know, uh, radar return uh, does not uh, correlate very well. You can take a look at it on the face of an oscilloscope, and it's difficult to take and uh, say exactly what the, you know, the pulses are that are the return signal. If you have a very um, good reflector of a radar signal, that will give you a sharp pulse, but Lots of other stuff, uh, you kind of uh, uh, get a lot of garbled mess, which we, again we call uh, uh, grass, actually is the term for it, clutter. So as mentioned earlier, different types of targets reflect different amounts of the transmitted radar pulses. Metal objects, like other vehicles, will, will reflect more signal than a human being or deer in the path of the radar. Again, the need for very sophisticated radar systems to be able to resolve exactly what is being seen in the echo return and additional information about its size, direction, velocity. This is sometimes known as pattern recognition or classification. There are different types of radar systems depending upon the particular application. The radars that have been presented to this point were used for target detection and target ranging. The output pulse rate could typically be varied to change the system range and the antenna was physically steerable, which allowed it to be aimed or possibly scanned. These things are known as primary radars. As radar technology evolved, different types of radars were implemented. <clears throat> a secondary radar has a different function than a primary radar. The secondary radar receives a signal and then acts as a transponder, usually responding to the received signal, what we call the interrogation message, and answering back on a different frequency. Applications of this type of radar are usually involved with aircraft identification activities. That is, ground radar can identify commercial aircraft or hence air traffic control.
Primary radars may be either pulsed, usually high power, or continuous wave, CW, usually lower power. Most of what has already been presented about radars concerned pulsed radars. Again, changing the rate of the narrow transmitted pulse will change the radar range and resolution. However, there are different signal processing techniques that can be used to look at the received echoes and measure the velocity of the target. So let's talk about Doppler and MTI radar. So moving, moving target indicator, or MTI, and Doppler radars both are used to measure tar target velocity or pick moving targets out of stationary targets. The MTI radar uses a very low pulse repetition rate, while the Doppler radar uses a high repetition rate. The MTI radar suffers from Doppler ambiguities, while the Doppler radar suffers from range ambiguities. These radars work on the principle of the Doppler shift occurred by moving. So this slide shows the Doppler equation. And uh, I'm not going to go into great deal detail, detail here, but the Doppler equation for radio frequency signals is as follows for a fixed radar. So the frequency of Doppler shift is equal to the frequency you're transmitting times 1 plus or minus the relative velocity of the object divided by C. Um, the higher you go in frequency, the more the Doppler shift. Uh, the sign used in the equation depends upon the relative direction of motion of the radar and the target, uh, plus if moving towards the radar and minus if moving away from the radar. The radar signal processing might measure the phase shift between successive echoes. So let's talk more about CW radars. Another type of radar is the continuous wave or CW radar. In this case, the reflected signal from the target is compared to the transmitted signal from the radar. There are basically two types of CW radars, unmodulated and modulated. The unmodulated CW radar transmits a single frequency, while the modulated CW radar typically sweeps through a range of frequencies. The former can measure speed, while the latter can measure distance or range. Radar altimeter technology is what that is used for. What about radar antennas? Well, we already mentioned a key component of a radar system is the antenna. Fortunately, a great deal of progress has been made over the years in improving antenna technology. Today, it is possible to implement phased array antennas that can be stationary and yet can be made to scan the area in front of them. The use of millimeter wave frequencies allows much higher antenna gains, which can increase system gain and directional resolution. Uh, this is about a busy slide here, but nevertheless, let's take a look at it. This is a phased array radar antenna. A uh, diagram shows how a fixed phased array antenna system can be made to receive signals from a particular direction. As shown, there are eight, numbered zero to seven, identical antenna elements which are laid out in a repeating pattern. They're equally spaced and parallel in direction. If each antenna has a phase shift of n times delta theta, where n is the number of the antenna element, then the beam direction is equal to theta, well, phi maybe, <laughs> theta I think here, the last one was n times delta phi, I think, as shown by the diagram. Again, my phi's and thetas mixed up. Uh, so there's an interesting uh, link there at the bottom of the page under the diagram. If you go to that Wikipedia uh, link, it turns out there's an animation that shows this process, and it's pretty cool. So again, my antenna can be stationary, and I can scan uh, if I have a two-dimensional antenna that is both vertical and horizontal elements. I can scan in two dimensions. Now, there are two types of automotive radars. Today, basically two types used for automotive applications, known as long or mid-range and short-range radar systems. The long-range systems, these are mostly traditional radars, typically have a range of about 200 to 300 meters and operate at 76 to 77 gigahertz. The short range systems are usually known as ultra wide band or UWB radars and operate at the lower frequency of 28 gigahertz with better resolution but a shorter range. So here's a couple Bosch automotive long range radar systems. Uh, they're broken apart so you can see what the um, you know, various components are. There's a second generation and a third generation. And it turns out that uh, here are two other diagrams that show the radars as they are packaged. And where these are located is under usually the logo on the, uh, you know, the uh, grill of the car. 
So it turns out that uh, uh, you know, there's some funny stories about how you know the uh, uh, some car manufacturer used metal logos. Of course, the radar signal couldn't go through it, but nevertheless, uh, usually today uh, those logos are plastic, and the signal will propagate through uh, you know the uh, uh, logo. So typically, there would be several application areas for automotive radar systems that will need different radar types. Forward-looking short and long-range radar systems are needed for collision avoidance applications, while there's also a need to have almost 360-degree vehicle coverage. Typically, very close-in applications will have to be handed over to ultrasonic sensors due to the extremely short return time for radar echo. We call the one foot per nanosecond rate. And we already talked about ultrasonic applications. So here's, a, again, an example, radar ranging. So I'm not going to go over the details here, but this one says uh, the specifications for the Bosch medium range radar say that it has a range of 0.36 to 160 meters. Do you determine the echo delay time for these distances? Well, it turns out for the short three tenths, uh, let's see, round trip time is 1.066.7 nanoseconds or 1,066.7 nanoseconds, or 1.0067 microseconds for the 160 meter distance. Uh, for the 0.36 meters, it turns out the round trip time is in the order of 2,400 picoseconds. So obviously the minimum ranging distance is a function of the limitations of the speed of the electronic circuitry and or signal processing capabilities. And we're starting to get down to uh, very high speeds here uh, needed to actually make this thing work at the 0.36 meters. What about the Doppler effect? Well, here's a, another example, and it says the specifications for the Bosch long-range radar say that it has a speed accuracy of plus or minus 0.1 meters per second. Determine the Doppler shift that would be encountered by this sensor while moving at 65 miles per hour and receiving an echo from a stationary object. If you do the math, it turns out to be 7,458.1 hertz, or roughly 7.4581 kilohertz. And this slide shows where I might use radar for a car. Uh, the gray shows radar usage, while the yellow and orange shows ultrasonic usage for the sensors. Now, the newest and hottest technology for automotive advanced driver assistance systems, or ADAS systems, um, is known as LIDAR, which is sometimes known, taken as the acronym for light detection and ranging. A LIDAR system uses a pulse laser beam in its operation. Currently, there are several different implementations of this rapidly evolving technology that is used to produce 3D maps of the sensor surroundings. However, the advent of solid state LIDAR is poised to disrupt ADAS sensing. The basic operation of this is the following. Uh, LIDAR is a tool used to measure the shape and contour of the ground and environment. It works by bouncing laser, laser pulses off of a target and then measuring the time and distance each pulse travel. The science employed is based on the physics of light and optics. For a LIDAR system, light is emitted from a rapidly firing laser, typically emitting infrared that is non-visible wavelengths. Laser light travels out from the LIDAR system and reflects off points of things in the environment like buildings, street signs, and tree branches. The reflected light energy from each laser beam then returns to the LIDAR sensor where it is recorded. Time of flight, or TOF, is the way LIDAR measures the environment and is the most viable and proven technique used for detecting targets. How about a brief history of LIDAR? Well, LIDAR was invented fairly recently in the 1960s, but the first generation of these systems typically used for surveying applications. Of course, lasers didn't come into popular use or you know, weren't perfected really until about that time also. Uh, during the Apollo 15 mission in 1971, the astronauts used a laser altimeter to map the surface of the moon, I should say. Uh, many of the first applications of these systems involved creating topographical maps of the Earth's surface from airborne mounted units. 
more modern, less expensive LIDAR units were mechanical in nature and were more or less introduced to the public for autonomous automotive applications in the DARPA Grand Challenge in 2004. Since that time, Google, a leader in the implementation of driverless automobiles, has showcased LIDAR systems as integral parts of this technology. Other automotive manufacturers also have adopted this technology. So here's a picture of the uh, Google self-driving cars with roof-mounted LIDARs. Uh, these were mechanical. Uh, as you can see, a, a big you know, structure on top of a car. Um, they were not very aesthetically pleasing. And interestingly enough, the cost of these LIDARs was in excess of $100,000, and that's in 2004 money. So that would be, you know, maybe a quarter million dollars piece in today's money. So what's happened is we've had some improvements in LIDAR. There's a Ford car, probably back from about five or six years ago. These are newer LIDARs, a lot smaller than the earlier visions, versions, rather. And notice there's four of them on this vehicle on that rack on top. So what's happened with mechanical LIDAR evolution? Well, smaller mechanical LIDAR systems used a spinning mirror in conjunction with a laser beam to scan out a 360 degree coverage area. Even more advanced versions of this type of LIDAR use multiple laser beams to improve the amount of reflected light. 16 and then 64 beam LIDAR systems are produced and have been used by Ford, for instance, automakers for test systems. Furthermore, the physical size of the system has been reduced. Now, MEMS-based LIDAR are the new rage, and recent breakthroughs in MEMS, which is microelectromechanical systems technology, have allowed for the introduction of non-mechanical LIDAR systems with a further reduction in both cost and size. Uh, right now, the cost is very prohibitive. Even the, uh, you know, the MEMS-based ones cost $10,000 a piece. Uh, this type of technology is similar to MEMS DLP technology from Texas Instrument, an array of micro miniature mirrors that can be controlled electronically to project a high definition TV picture. It's a standard component in a home theater or computer projector. What about solid state based LiDAR? Well, using an optical phased array or OPA and solid state CMOS technology, all solid state LiDAR devices substantially reduce the cost of adding this new technology to an automobile. Uh, it is believed that two LIDARs with color camera add-ons and a forward seeing and backward seeing radar are all that are needed to provide complete 360 degree sensing and enough data redundancy to allow for SAE level five autonomy for a vehicle. Now, uh, SAE level five is a totally autonomous vehicle. So here's some examples of what LiDAR 3D point cloud maps look like. Here's one example. Here's another example. And here is a Lumotive LiDAR. A uh, company na named Lumotive claims to have made a solid state LiDAR using metasurface technology. I believe this is a artist's rendition of what that looks like. Um, Meta surfaces are surfaces that can change their characteristics. Uh, notice it's a 905 nanometer diode laser, which is infrared. Of course, they show red coming out of it, which is something our eyes can see, but we would not be able to see the 905 nanometer infrared signal. What about camera tense technology? Well, camera technology has evolved greatly over the past two decades with the advent of digital cameras and the demise of film. One only needs to consider the smartphone and their multi-megapixel cameras or 4K high-definition TVs and the quality of the picture to realize that camera technology has never been better. All cameras, including video cameras, have become smaller and less expensive at the same time. So what is modern camera technology? Well, camera technology today relays upon sensors that react to light wavelengths, that is the visible light, and electromagnetic waves of other wavelengths infrared and so forth. It is commonplace to use CMOS technology to create the sensor. A common type of sensor technology is the active pixel sensor or APS, which gives rise to the active pixel sensor imager. Uh, here's an APS imager. Uh, through IC manufacturing technology, it's possible to have thousands of pixels in both horizontal and vertical direction on a chip. Many of today's cell phones 
of resolution of megapixels. And of course, using different types of materials, we can detect infrared as well as visible light. As mentioned previously, there are ADAS systems that can be implemented with camera technology. Rear view or backup cameras were required by the uh, NHTSA, uh, National Highway Transportation Safety um, Association, on all new vehicles made after May 2018. Uh, combined with additional sensors or pattern recognition software, these systems can warn the driver of objects in the backup path passenger rear looking side view cameras are standard in some vehicles uh, and Elon Musk claims that Tesla will have self-driving cars that only use camera technology others believe that he will eventually recant this claim um, I just saw an article today that said that uh, there's been about 10 accidents with Tesla's uh, where they've come in uh, close proximity uh, to EMT you know first responder type vehicles with flashing lights and so forth. So it looks like something in their software using just camera technology uh, is missing those vehicles because there's been crashes that Teslas have been involved with. Uh, again, Elon Musk claims they will not use radar or LIDAR, but a lot of people think that's just a, a bluff on his part. Okay, so Camera technology and automotive applications continuing. Sensor data fusion combines the benefits of different sensors and measuring, measuring principles in the most effective way possible. This technique provides data that individual sensors working independently are unable to generate. Data fusion of multiple sensors increases the measurement reliability, range, and accuracy. Additionally, the different measuring principles are also used to confirm detected objects. multi camera and radar sensor, long range or mid range radar complement each other ideally. Using sophisticated software algorithms, the fusion of sensor data generates an extremely detailed image, which forms a basis for a powerful interpretation of the vehicle's surroundings. So here's a slide that shows you a picture of radar video camera combination. And notice that the radar is the blue pulses, where the camera is taking and also looking in the same forward direction. Uh, by the way, uh, this uh, shows a camera module for driver assist. Uh, today's newest cars use cameras mounted in front of the rear view mirror, like the one shown here. How about night vision technology? The term automotive night vision refers to a number of systems that help increase the driver's awareness when it's dark out. These systems extend the perception of the driver beyond the limited reach of the headlights through the use of thermographic cameras, infrared lights, heads-up displays, and other technologies. Night vision can alert drivers to the presence of potential hazards before they become visible. Automotive, automotive night vision systems are broken into two basic categories, which are referred to as active and passive infrared. Active night vision systems use, use infrared light sources to eliminate the darkness, and passive systems rely on the thermal radiation that is emitted from cars, animals, and other potential hazards. The systems both rely on infrared data, but each one has its own benefits and drawbacks. Active systems are much more complex than passive systems because they use infrared light sources. Now, since human eyes do not respond to the infrared wavelengths, oncoming cars with high beam infrared lights will not blind the other drivers. This allows the infrared lights to illuminate objects that are significantly further away than visible light headlights are able to reach. Also, since infrared light is invisible to the human eye, active night vision systems use special cameras to relay the extra visual data. Some systems use pulsed infrared lights and others use a constant light source. These systems don't work very well in adverse weather conditions, but they do provide high contrast images of vehicles, animals, and even inanimated, inanimate objects. Passive systems don't use their own light sources, so they rely on thermographic or infrared cameras to detect thermal radiation. Uh, you may have seen thermal cameras, uh, IR cameras on television where they look at uh, you know, sources of leaks of energy in a house and where you should take and put uh, extra insulation. Uh, this technique tends to work very well with animals and other vehicles since they emit a lot of thermal radiation. However, passive IR systems have trouble picking up non-living objects 
they're about the same temperature as the surrounding environment. Uh, for instance, a tree. Uh, the range of passive IR night vision systems tends to be significantly higher than the range of active night vision, which is due to the limited power of the light sources used by the active systems. The image quality produced by the thermographic cameras tends to be inferior when compared to the active systems. So here's a Toyota night vision technology heads up display, it looks like. Uh, so this is on the dash, and you can see that it has picked out two people uh, walking. And, uh, you know, normally you wouldn't be able to see them uh, with your own eyes. Other sensors. At this point, the most common important automotive ADAS sensors have been introduced. However, there are more sensors which typically have to do with less well-known ADAS applications. The impaired driver ADAS field seeks to prevent accidents or collisions due to the possible case of the driver becoming impaired for whatever reason. In the United States, according to the NHTSA, there are four major causes of fatal automobile accidents, drunk driving, speeding, distracted driving, and drowsy driving. Other risk factors are drug driving, without much data to back it up, and the lack of seatbelt use. Another very real risk factor would be the occurrence of medical emergencies, things like fainting, seizures, and so forth. Although few ADAS systems have been implemented to deal with the impaired driver, this is an area that could potentially have the greatest impact of saving lives. Certainly, the technology exists today to implement systems that will prevent an alcohol impaired driver from being able to start a car. However, these systems are only put in place by court order. It's a solution SAE level five technology. One would get a very fierce debate on this topic from a person in the law enforcement field. Usually their contention is that even if the impaired driver is a lone passenger and in the back seat, they are legally responsible for the operation of the car. As of today, 2021, 29 states have passed laws about the operation of autonomous vehicles on public roadways. Um, about nine more states have, have uh, uh, not passed laws, but have had, you know, government uh, regulations put in place. Surely as a transition to higher, highly autonomous vehicles, or HAVs, continues, there will be debate about legal and moral issues concerning this technology. In the meantime, researchers are studying impairedness and proposing solutions to problems like distracted driving, drowsiness, and medical emergencies. You know, medical conditions induced blackouts, things like diabetic coma, epileptic seizures, heart attacks, and so forth. Uh, it's amazing how many times you see in a newspaper or hear a, a report about a uh, crash that's occurred for no uh, reason that they can determine. And uh, uh, a lot of times these are medical emergencies that cause a person to just drift off the highway. The vast majority of this research is focused on physical clues of impairment, how we would see an impaired driver. So some novel solutions have been proposed. One example is Bosch's ADAS steering angle sensor. This provides the vehicle steering angle by measuring the angular position of the steering wheel. From the steering angle, vehicle speed and desired braking pressure or the position of the accelerator pedal, the intention of the driver is calculated. You might call this AI or ML. So here's this Bosch steering angle sensor. Most proposed impaired driver ADAS systems involve monitoring the driver's physical movements, where the driver's eyes are focused and so forth. These eyes on the road systems will alert the driver in an attempt to return their attention to the task at hand, driving. Other systems concerning medical emergencies are most likely off in the future. Most of this type of technology is dependent upon the use of cameras to observe the driver and then use software algorithms that make decisions about the driver's actions, and whether or not a warning or some more extreme action is warranted. There are some interesting videos on YouTube that demonstrate how these distracted driver systems might be deployed. So what about the use of sensor data fusion? Sensor data fusion is an intimidating term but all it really stands for is a merging of sensor data about the same physical phenomena. Earlier, the case for the use of both radar and video data for making powerful interpretations of a vehicle's surroundings was made. Radar targets are not that easy to identify. However, combine the radar data with video of the same scene after using pattern recognition or classification software, 
and one has much better results. The design of ADAS systems tend to be complex due to the complex nature of the required desired control function. Sensor data from one or more ADAS sensors is sent to the self-contained ADAS system for consideration by the system. An example of this might be the Automatic Emergency Brake System, the AEB. This system, through complex software algorithms and sensor data inputs, attempts to determine whether or not the brakes need to be applied to avoid a collision. The system, if it detects a potential problem in pending collision, will first alert the driver that braking is needed. This is accomplished with the various warnings. So if the driver does not respond by braking, or if the braking is insufficient, the ADAS system will take control of the braking system, calculating the required braking force, and attempt to avoid a collision or at least minimize the speed and impact to lessen the danger to the 